Good morning, class, and welcome to Bible Doctrine 3. Bible Doctrine 3, and today is going to be a really great lesson. I'm believing that God is going to help us in a tremendous way. We need His anointing every day of our lives. We especially need His anointing to help us and guide us and to help us get into the Word of the Lord because we need to not only be able to teach the Word of the Lord, but we need to be able to understand what we're teaching because even as the Bible told us that the Ethiopian was reading the Word and uh, the man of God asked him, do you understand what you're reading? And so Bible doctrine is helping equip us. Bible school is helping equip us so that we can understand, so that we can then help others understand. And so the purpose of Bible doctrine is to get us all on an equal, solid foundation with understanding of the Word of God. And so welcome today to Bible doctrine number three. And we're going to get into lesson number seven today, Bible doctrine three and lesson number seven. And we are going to be discussing the regeneration, regeneration, and Bible Doctrine 3, Lesson 7 in my book is on page number 36. And I can't believe that we're already into Lesson number 7 and then tomorrow, Lesson number 8 of Bible Doctrine 3. So we're getting very, very close to getting into, or we are in the second half of Bible Doctrine 3, already. Time is flying. God is doing great things and we are uh, covering a lot of information. Now it's important to remember that through our sessions, our sessions are, are limited by time and so we understand that we are laying a foundation of biblical doctrine. All of these lessons that we're covering, everything that we've been studying, they in fact could be entire courses, not just classes, but entire courses on their own. And so it's important to understand that when we talk about lessons like we've covered with the name of Jesus, those are, are lessons that could go on and on and on and courses, complete courses, be developed in those lessons. So Bible doctrine is our Bible doctrine one, two, three, and four, the very purpose of these courses is to get us all, everyone that would watch every class, uh, that, that we would all be on the same foundation of biblical understanding. And so all of these things are much deeper subjects than we can cover in our allotted time. And so what we do is we lay a foundation for your future, for you to build upon and for you to then unbox those thoughts and ideas. And once you have a solid foundation, then you're able to do this in a much, much better fashion. And so uh, it's, it's important to remember that these lessons are not in depth. They are not covering the full spectrum, but they are introducing the concept. And so when you introduce a concept, um, that, is, that is laying that foundation with purpose and intent and then pointing the person toward a deeper study. And so we're doing that with Bible Doctrine. And so in way of review, over the last few weeks of Bible Doctrine 3, we have covered the titles of Jesus. That was lesson number one. We've covered the name of Jesus in lesson number two. And then in lesson number three, we covered salvation. Lesson four, we covered repentance. And then lesson five, we covered faith. Lesson six, justification. And then today, today, this morning, we're going to cover lesson number seven, regeneration. All of these things are very powerful words. Matter of fact, if you'll notice uh, from lesson number six, lesson seven, and lesson eight are very powerful words. It's justification, regeneration, and sanctification. And so we're going to do our best to... Uh, open up uh, our understanding by defining these things and then lay in a proper foundation for biblical understanding and biblical study. That is the two main purposes for Bible doctrine, biblical understanding and biblical study because it helps us understand and it promotes us into the proper direction of true biblical doctrine in that subject. And so as we get into our class today, we want to go to the Lord in prayer as we get ready to begin uh, Bible Doctrine 3, lesson number 7, page number 36. 
and then page number 37 will start the lesson. But let's go to the Lord in prayer and let's ask God to help us as we dig down into this lesson uh, concerning regeneration. Very powerful lesson, but let's go to the Lord and ask him to help us. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your goodness. God, we're praying that you'd give us strength. I need your strength. I need your help, Lord, that I'd be able to cover this subject in a way that would be pleasing to you. God, I pray that you would anoint me. Let this be uh, done with passion. Let it be done with, with anointing, with fire. God, I need the strength of the Holy Ghost. If there be anything in me that's not like you, I pray that you would forgive me of that. Bring this word to my mind. Help me to be able to convey it in a way that would be godly and pleasing to you and in a way that is understanding to the students, to those that will be watching uh, uh, in the next few days, those that will be watching in the next few months, those that will be watching for years to come. I pray, God, that you would bring that revelation to pass. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for being attentive to the things of God. Regeneration lesson number seven, and that is page 37. Regeneration, the definition of the new birth. And as we get into this, I want to begin with the definition of regeneration. Now, we will get into that in a couple of paragraphs, but I want to just kind of start with that so that we can uh, see the flow of the lesson. Regeneration is the impartation of a new and divine life. A new creation, the production of a new thing. Regeneration is the impartation of a new and divine life. A new creation, the production of a new thing. So the definition of the new birth, according to John 3 and 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things, remember our definition for regeneration, it is a new creation. And so 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. That is the regeneration. All things are passed away, and behold, all things are become New And then Paul said in Ephesians 4 and 24, And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So in John 3 and 3, we know that a man has to be born again. That is the process of regeneration. In 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, we know that he is a new or becomes a new creature. Old things passed away. Behold, all things become new. And then again in Ephesians 4, 24, we see the same concept of regeneration as the writer said that he is puts on a new man, but that new man is after God. He is created in the righteousness of God, created after righteousness and true holiness. So regeneration is not the old becoming something uh, old again, but it is the old man. Uh, he does not change or transform into something uh, that is still um, uh, carnal in nature, but he transforms into something new. It's a new life. It's not the same old life with the same old ways, with the same old habits and the same old sins, uh, but it is a new life. It's not the same old failures, but it is a new creation. It's not a life filled with the same old mistakes, but it is a new creation. So the Lord forgives through the process of the new birth, the death the burial and the resurrection, the, 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 the water and of the spirit. Now we are created something new. No longer am I held captive by my past, by my failures, by my sins. So when we repent, when we're born again, there is a 
regeneration. Now we've talked about justification and now we're talking about regeneration. This is the process of something new being created inside of us. And so people have always asked me, how is it, and we've discussed it, but people have always asked, how is it that God can forgive Give us in this great degree. Well, he's not just forgiving an old man. He's not just forgiving a man full of mistakes. He's not just forgiving a man that is full of sin and, and failure, but he is recreating, regenerating a new creature. So literally, he is redeeming fallen man and turning man in through the new birth process into a new creation. I, I'm not the man I used to be. I'm not the fallen one I used to be. I'm not the mistakes that I've made in the past, but I am regenerated by the new birth. Old things passed away. My past is gone. My mistakes are gone. This this all right here, God's moving right now. God is, is talking to somebody. The failures that you made in the past, they can be gone by the power of regeneration when we repent, when we're baptized in his name, filled with the spirit, then we're loose to do when we mess up. We are loose to do our first work. Our first work it was repentance. When we repent, he's just, he's faithful to forgive us. And the process of regeneration is so complete that I may look the same. My voice may sound the same. My, my eye color is still the same. My, well, my hair, I started to say my hair is still the same, but my hair has changed colors but but it, i i become something new i i may look like i used to look but i am not the way that i used to be on the inside there is something new on the inside something new working do you feel that i i feel that in the holy ghost that's that's a word for somebody you're not your mistakes you're not your past you're not your failures uh, but there is a regeneration that is happening in you and that's why it's so important to understand the power of not just justification but but also regeneration he's not just forgiving you in the in in the failure and leaving you a failure he's not just forgiving you of your sin and leaving you a sinner he's not just forgiving you of your mistakes mistakes and leaving you a mistake but he is regenerating he's taken the the past and turning it into a future he's taken the pain and turning it into healing he's taking a, the regret and changing it into regeneration he's taking the loss and turning it to victory there's something completely new created on the inside of us. You may look the same, but you're not the same. Look at your neighbor right now and tell him, I'm not the same. I look the same. I, I've i worn this to class before, I, but I'm not the same. I, I may look the same, sound the same, sing the same, but I'm not the same because I've been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. I am not bound to my past. I'm not bound to my mistakes, but I have been redeemed by the blood of the lamb there is a regeneration there is a there is a new work remember that regeneration is the impartation of a new and divine life it's not something i could get on my own but it's god so loved us that he imparted this new and divine life this new creation this new production, a new thing inside of us. That's powerful. I, I love that right there. Somebody ought to forgive yourself of the past because the Lord's already done that. Somebody ought to go ahead and just become everything that God called you to be because he's created something new in you. You're not who you were. I, I've, I've said it like this preaching before and I've heard it said many times. This isn't new to me, but I all say it like this. Um, I'm not everything I want to be. I want more of God. I want to grow in the Spirit. I'm not everything I want to be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. I may not be everything I desire to be, but I'm not everything that I used to be. God's done a work, and God's got us on a process. You are not everything that you want to be, but you are not who you used to be. Look the same but you're not the same. In Jesus' name, there is a work of regeneration. By regeneration, we are admitted into the kingdom of God. 
There is no other way of becoming a child of God but by being born again of the water and of the Spirit. Regeneration is not just a natural forward step in man's development, but it is a supernatural act of God. I love that. I'm going to repeat that. Regeneration is not just a natural forward step in man's development, but it is a supernatural act of God. It is not evolution, but it is the impartation of a new life. It is a revolution, a change of direction resulting from that impartation of God. Number one, a spiritual awakening occurs at new birth. Regeneration is the impartation and new of a new and divine life, a new creation, the production of a new thing. It is Genesis 1.26 all over again. It's not the old nature altered. We've been talking about that. It's not the old nature reformed. It's not the old nature revigorated. But in the new birth, it is a new and divinely imparted nature of God that comes only from God when we are obedient to the new birth. By nature, man is dead in sin, according to Ephesians 2 and 1. The new birth imparts to him a new life. The life of God is imparted to man. So that henceforth he is, as those that are alive from the dead, he has passed out of death into life. He's been called out of the darkness into the marvelous light. And that is according to John 3. 3 through 7, John 5, verse 21, and Ephesians 2, and verse number 10. Very powerful scriptures. Number 2, the impartation of a new nature. Through the act of regeneration, God imparts to the child of God a new nature. He becomes a brand new person, a brand new creation in Christ. 2 Peter 1 and 2, Ephesians 4, 24, Colossians 3 and 10, Galatians 2 and 20, 1 John 3, 9, and 1 John 3, 6 through 9. The necessity of the new birth. The Bible says in John 3 and 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So we're understanding that the new birth is a necessity. The definition of the new birth can be found in a spiritual awakening. It can be found in the impartation of a new nature. And so now we are getting into the section of the necessity of the new birth. We know that the Bible declared that in John 3 and then again in Galatians 6 and 15. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision but a new creature. Romans 8 and 8. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So we know by these scriptures they become the witness that the new birth is necessary for regeneration. Page number 38, number one says, the need is universal. And we're talking about the necessity of the new birth. The new birth is a universal need. The new birth is not just for a select few. It's not just for a select few cultures. It's not just for a select few people in a select few countries. But it is a universal need. How do we know this? Well, we know this because sin is a universal condition. And because sin is a universal condition, then the new birth becomes a universal requirement. Does that make sense? Sin is a universal condition, so the new birth becomes a universal requirement. Man that is born, he is born full of sin and needs the forgiveness of God and the new birth provided by God. So the sin condition is universal. If you can find a man never born a sinner uh, outside of Jesus Christ, then you will find a man that does not need the new birth. But that is not biblical because the Bible said all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And because all have sinned, that makes the need 
for salvation or the new birth experience to be universal. The need is as far-reaching as sin, and the human race is all caught up and condemned in sin. No age, no sex, position, or condition is exempt from anyone. We all need the new birth because we have all sinned. Man's sinful condition demands it. The heart is deceitful and does not welcome God. We need to be pure in heart to see God. No education, culture, nor culture can bring about such a needed change. God alone is the only one that can do it. Because sin is universal, the universal need for the new birth demands that we come to the Lord. Because we cannot change ourselves, we have to have an encounter with the Lord. John 3 and 6 declares it like this, That which is born of flesh is flesh. Jeremiah 13, 23, Can the Ethiopian change his skin, or the leopard his spots? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. And then Romans 7 and 18, In my flesh dwelleth no good thing. So that proves the necessity of the new birth. Because in our flesh is no good thing. We need to be regenerated. Our flesh needs to be made new. We need to be connected to the Lord. So not only is our uh, new birth necessary because of the universal need and because of man's universal condition, but the holiness of God demands it. So not only is the need of the new birth centered upon the fact that all have sinned, that's man's part, but now also God's holiness demands it. So there's a twofold requirement, a twofold necessity of salvation. It's that man's sin demands it, and God's holiness demands it. If without holiness no man shall see the Lord, according to Hebrews 12, 14, and if holiness is not obtained by any natural development or self-effort, then regeneration of our nature is an absolute necessity. How then, how we may understand, how shall we understand the new birth? So we know that the new birth is necessary, so now we must understand the new birth, so that we can obey that which is necessary. Jesus compared regeneration with the natural birth when he told Nicodemus that he had to be born again. Jesus used expressions, born of water, born of the Spirit. In the epistles, we find scriptures that speak of being born of water. Three steps in the natural birth, yet only one birth. Conception, that's the planting of the seed. Physical birth, that's the birth of the water. And then number three, breath enters the newborn baby. These three steps completely coincide with their spiritual nature of being born again. The same as the Lord told Nicodemus. He said, you got to be born again of water and spirit. Nicodemus said, how can I, who am old, be born twice? How can I be born again? How can I do this? Because shall I enter into my mother's womb a second time? And Jesus, is, he's telling him, no, that's the natural birth. But now I'm going to show you the what coincides with the spiritual birth. And so the conception, the physical birth, and the breath that enters the newborn all coincides with the three steps in spiritual birth, uh, yet there's only one birth, hearing and believing the gospel, water baptism in Jesus' name, and the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And we know that those that hear and believe the gospel will repent. Now, if you want to, for, for just easier clarification in your notes on that, on page 38, number one at the bottom, where it says hearing and believing the gospel, we fully believe that, but out to the side of that, for your future reference, you can write the word repentance because that makes better sense in, in my opinion so that we can, and we know because of our past lessons, if you hear and believe, then that leads to repentance. But I, I put down, I would like for you to put down, number one, repentance. Number two is water baptism in Jesus' name. Number three, baptism of the Holy Ghost. And so I'm not attempting to correct anything written. I'm just giving you a more clear 
view for your future teaching. So at the bottom of page 38, number one, just put repentance out to the side, or you can mark through what's there and just put repentance, or you can put hearing and believing the gospel leads to repentance as number one. If you have any questions about that, feel free to ask. This is true scriptural statements. We are born of the word, we are born of the water, and we are born of the spirit, yet it all refers to one new birth. The means of regeneration, in, or, in, in other words, how does it work? The means means how, how does it work? How does it come to pass? So number one, it's a divine work. According to John 1 and uh, verse 13, born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So it is a divine work. John 3 and 5, be born of the Spirit. It's a divine work. James 1, 18, of his own will beget us divinely. That is a work of the Spirit. Titus 3 and 5, renewing of the Holy Ghost. It's a divine work. So how does regeneration come to pass? Number one, it's a divine work. Number two, now it's man's work. It's a human work. John 1, 12, as many as receive him, we have to receive him. He imparts, we receive. So the means of regeneration is number one, it's a work of God. And number two, it's a response of man. So if you want to put that down, man's part, you can put response of man. It's the response of man to God's divine work that produces regeneration. And number three, it's born of the word. For in Christ Jesus have I begotten you through the gospel. And then for our Peter, yeah, 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible by the word of God. Through hearing the gospel, the word of life, the life-giving seed is planted in the heart. If the soil is right and the conditions are uh, suitable, the seed will germinate and grow. And this is is compared with James 1 and 8, the word of truth. So we know the means of regeneration is from God, uh, from man, from the word, and then number four, born of water, from the water. This is baptism in Jesus' name. John 3 and 5, except a man be born again of water. Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Titus 3, 5, by the washing of regeneration. Hebrews 10, at 22, our bodies washed with pure water. First Peter 3, 21, even baptism doeth now save us. And so we know that the means of regeneration is from God, from man, born of the word or belief in the word. Number four, born of the water. That's Jesus' name, baptism. Number five, born of the spirit. That is the Holy Ghost. Uh, Romans 8, 16, the spirit itself bears witness unto our spirit that ye are the children of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you. And then 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says it like this, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Drink into one spirit. Being born of the spirit is the baptism of the Holy Ghost, evidenced by speaking in other tongues. So what are the means of regeneration? It is a work of God. It is a response of man to the word of God, and then born of water, born of spirit. And then E, when we follow these regenerations, uh, the steps, the means of regeneration, uh, adoption. Again, if you want to flip back and look at verse or page 39, when it says born of the word, um, you can make a side note there that that's a great place to insert repentance uh, because I believe uh, not only as a, a gospel preacher, not only as an evangelist, but as an apostolic uh, United Pentecostal preacher, I believe it's important that we not overlook or misstate uh, repentance. I know that born of word leads in repentance, but if you'll remember uh, back on page 38, down at the bottom, number one, hearing and believing the gospel, we put out repentance by that because we need to be abundantly clear that it takes repentance 
as part of the new birth and part of regeneration. So the means of regeneration is a divine work. It is a work of man's part. But And then we talked about born of word. But if you'll notice, we went to born of water and born of spirit. But we never really talked about repentance. And so down on number three on page 39, you can leave a little note to make sure that repentance is preached at this place. The word of God is something that we have to believe in, obviously, but the word of God is full of repentance preaching. And so I don't want to just say it's a divine work. It's a man work on man's part and then believe in the word. All that's true, but I don't want to skip and jump to water. But does that, does that make sense? I don't want to jump to water baptism and, and being born of the spirit without talking about repentance. We must repent because if we don't repent, we're just getting wet in the water and we'll never be filled with the Holy Ghost without repentance. So does that make sense? Any questions, just, just ask me. So out by step three, page 39, I put a side note, make sure, or put a side note, make sure to deal with repentance here if you're going to reteach this. D on page number 40, adoption. Adoption means the placing of a son. It is a Roman word. Uh, the Roman word for adoption was hardly known among the Jews, and the word is Pauline, and he, he it is written uh, this way. It is used, or it is used, when the questions of privileges and heirship are involved. So in other words, the word adoption was used to deem who would be the heir of, the, of, of a property or a man's home. And so this adoption would bring you in as a real son, and because of that, you would have the right to the father's inheritance. And so it would be the same when we are adopted into Christ. We're regenerated into his spirit. We become adopted by him. And because of that, we become heirs to him. Uh, adoption takes place at the new birth, according to John 1 and 12, Galatians 3, 26, 1 John 3 and 2. The com and then completed at the rapture, according to Romans 8, 19, Romans 8, 23, 1 John 3, 11 through 3. And so it is that the blessings of adoption are this, God's love, a fatherly care, a family name, family likeness, family love, chastisement, which means correction, and inheritance. All of those things are part of being regenerated from the old to the new. It's the taking off of the dirty garments of feeding the pig and the swine and putting on the garments that the Father said to bring. That is the regeneration. You're no longer that man that was serving and feeding the swine, but now you are back at the Father's house, completely restored, created, back to the place where you should be, back to that Genesis 1 26 experience. Re regeneration is a very powerful thing. So now, uh, in review, as we get ready to close out our class today, uh, we have covered justification, we have covered regeneration, or we've laid a base foundation for them. And in our next class, we are going to get into the word sanctification. And so justification, regeneration, and sanctification, all very powerful terms that all have distinct and powerful meanings. And I'm looking forward to our next class, believing that God's going to anoint us. I want each of you to have a fabulous day. Looking forward to seeing each and every one of you. I am looking forward to hearing more of the great things God's doing. God bless you. Thank you for being so attentive. We are going to endeavor into our third part and we're going to get into class. See you in our next class. God bless you in Jesus' name.